hello, hello. Open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. In verse 1, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And again, that word is fierce. It actually means fierce. Fierce times of coming. Are we, have we noticed any changes in our world? Oh, so many stories I could share, but they're not real good news of what I've heard lately. Um, it's, it's a day we have to protect ourselves. Even where you're going shopping and things, it's, it's, you've got to be aware of what your surroundings at all times. Perilous times. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. And this is kind of what I want to focus on. They shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasting, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. They even had a famous song called Unholy. I thought, wow, they're even singing about now. Every, all the scriptures are just coming alive, aren't they? Thank God he's prepared us <laughs> as much as we can be prepared that these perilous times are coming. And it says here in verse 3, without natural affection. And are we seeing that in our everywhere, schools and everywhere? Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. And on and on it goes there. And I just wanted to pick out this um, verse about they shall be lovers of themselves. And we're going to, I haven't talked about narcissism for a long time. And I know there are a group of our viewers that are dealing with this. And I've been kind of working on this for a couple of weeks. Thought it was time to talk about spiritual narcissism. They really don't go together. But this is uh, what a lot of people are dealing with. And I'm hoping and praying that this message could be a confirmation to some of you and also healing. Because when your pastor is a narcissist, it causes much abuse, much stress, uh, relational issues, and some are dealing with narcissistic uh, siblings or husbands or relatives or in-laws. It's everywhere. It's a plague. It's a plague, and I, I don't know what we're going to call this right now, but it's a plague of narcissism. And a plague means a painful and persistent epidemic. Narcissism affects a large number of people, and it's spread now on media, TV, movies, magazines, reality TV, and they want this to be normal. And it's not normal. It's not how God created this world or us, but we know as the Antichrist spirit is rising, one of the main things he wants to do is to invade churches. And so if you're in one of these narcissistic churches, Hopefully we'll give you some signs so that you know. We don't just want to call anybody a narcissist and go, you know, on that ditch. But there is a true problem in the churches today. And many narcissists are gravitating towards that position because that way they can get in front of people every week, get their, uh, you know, that, what do you call it, narcissistic, um, huh? Huh? Uh, it's an, I forget what the word is right now. But they get, they get that addiction and they get that fill and they, they like to be in front of people every week. And then they also, um, narcissists, love to play the God card. And because people are so hungry for the Lord, they come in as innocent little lambs. And they, some of them had abusive fathers or mothers and they're used to abuse. People that are healthy, they can spot these leaders out. But if most of us have come from situations of abuse, and so they gravitate towards churches, and it's kind of, if the dad was an abuser, then it's like when they get shamed from the pulpit, they're like, well, you know, that kind of reminds me of my dad. And it's all subconscious. It's not like you, ah, oh, yay, I want more abuse. But it's, it's, it's amazing how many people put up with some of these things. And we all have. Most of us have come from some of the same places. So today, the narcissistic personality disorder has been eliminated from the manual of the mental disorders. 
which psychiatrists use to diagnose mental illness. They have removed it from their manual. So narcissism is no longer a disorder or mental illness. Think about that. That confirms that we are in a narcissistic culture and society, just like 2 Timothy 3 right here tells us, they're going to be lovers of themselves. So here we are. <clears throat> just like the Bible warns, it's becoming now the norm. That's very sad, that narcissism is becoming so normal that people are used to, you can't even go and get counseling. Most people don't know what narcissism is, and if you go to a counselor to try to get help and they don't know what this is, that's a bad thing. You can get double whammied because they don't know how to counsel narcissists and they come, come across so charming that they get fooled. A lot of the counselors get played, so, but if you know what narcissism is, that's what I would say to someone, don't go to a counselor if they don't know what, uh, what narcissism is. If you're dealing with a narcissist or you're gonna have more trouble. You're not gonna get uh, the respect, you're not gonna get helped, you're gonna be more shamed and then they take sides. They play games and so you have to know what their game is. Now lovers of themselves, actually this is self-love. So this is proud. And just think about the devil, how proud he is, and how God wants us to walk humbly. He wants us in Malachi, he tells us to walk humbly with our God, and that's what we're, we're supposed to do. And so when we sense this spirit of arrogance and pride, it should be a red flag. That should be one of the first red flags when you see a narcissist in the pulpit or anywhere else you should see, wow, that is not uh, representing Christ. That's not who we're supposed to be following. That's not a good example. <clears throat> so they're proud, arrogant, conceited, boastful. Basically, basically the whole thing about narcissism is self-centeredness. And unfortunately, many people have been abused and they come from a lot of um, trauma. And so they, they get a false self. They put on, a, they don't want anyone to hurt them again and they haven't maybe been healed. I don't know, that's between them and God. There is such a spectrum of narcissism. It's impossible to say they're all the same because they're all different. Yeah. And some are on this spectrum, you know, on this end, and then others are way over on this end. So it's, you have to know them by their fruits. Right. You have to know what kind of a lifestyle they're living, what kind of fruit they're producing especially in churches because there's so much devastation from narcissism and people are shamed, they're bullied, uh, so many different things we're gonna get into. So all of it basically is self-centeredness and because of their self-centeredness, they leave a path of bad relationships. And the older a narcissist gets, if they don't get help and repent and change from their self-centeredness, uh, it just leaves devastation everywhere. There's no one usually stays with a narcissist. You see all their friendships because as they age, if they don't repent, they get worse. And I get a lot of letters from all of you about situations with a mother, with a father, with a brother, sister, in-laws. So someone in the Bible that I, in Second Samuel, let's look there, Amnon, I don't know if you've, I'm not gonna do a whole teaching on Abnon, but I think it's one of the saddest stories in the Bible, one of them, because Amnon uh, raped his sister, half-sister Tamar, and he was so cruel, so deceiving, so manipulative, and so lusting after her. He felt like he was in love with her, but he was really lusting after her. How do you know if it's lust? Because when you get something, you want it so bad, so bad, then you get it and you don't want it anymore. And that's part of a narcissistic spirit is greed of just su uh, stuff, collecting stuff, having stuff. And then the pastors compete with themselves, amongst themselves, who's got the biggest church, who's got the best, who's got the best cars. I've seen it all. I'm sure you have too. In 2 Samuel 13, 1, it's here. I'm just going to kind of uh, take your time and, and study this out. I just don't have time tonight. I've got a lot to get through. But this is uh, Amnon. 
who was also a son of David. And it's so sad about Tamar because Amnon, verse 2, he was vexed. He was so vexed, he wanted her so bad that he fell sick for his sister Tamar. For she was a virgin and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. He didn't know how he was going to be able to get her with him. And then he had a real great friend, Jonadab. <laughs> And he decided that they're going to lure her in. She's going to make food for him. And then basically when she gets into the chamber, he, and he does, he rapes her. And it's a very sad story. But this is just an example of someone that is so self-centered. He didn't think about her. He didn't think about the fruits or the results of what would happen because of his selfishness. And we know that Absalom killed Amnon because of what he did years later. But this is just a sad story. And there's so many different things in the Bible. There's um, so many different kings that were wicked. Ahab was a very self-centered king. Very self-centered. Uh, so it affects large numbers of people. And it spread, it spread everywhere. Uh, if you just watch, we used to watch House, and he's a typical narcissist. The Dr. House, he didn't care about anybody. This was an old show, an old series, but uh, very smart and brilliant, but didn't care how they treated people, didn't just, everything was about him. It was very hard for me to watch it. Now, I want to talk a little bit here about narcissism in the church. Now, you get someone and you add a position, a title, charisma, and if they have a, a verbal speaking gift and they use Bible language, it can be very harmful and dangerous. Or the abuse of power. And the Bible, in almost every chapter in the New Testament, talks about wolves, false teachers. And let no man deceive you, Matthew 24. So this is something that we really should realize. This isn't, shouldn't be shocking to us if we had teachers that prepared us and told us, this is what you look for. And when you see this, if they don't change, then you need to, you need to leave and find a different fellowship. And don't feel condemned about it. Because so many people are so hurt and they don't know where to go. They don't know, you know especially in church, because people don't talk about narcissism, but it's in the church. Uh, now, the word narc, of course, they all are, not all of them, but th to be a narcissist, it's self-centered and cruel. Some of them are very subtle, covert. Some are very blatant. It's obvious. There's all different kinds, like I said, very different spectrums. But they can also be very charismatic and very charming and magnetic, and so they draw a lot of people to them. So you can't be moved by how many people follow these people. And this is what's happened to our culture today. If they have a big crowd, they've got to be from God. No, not necessarily. Now, narcissism, the word comes from narc in the Greek, which means basically that you can't feel. If someone is a, a, nars, a narcotics, into narcotics, they just do drugs or they're um, alcoholics and they don't realize the damage they do to everyone around them. And they get to where they don't care what they do. They just want to feel good. So here this word is in the Greek means basically you can't feel. So they don't feel what other people feel. Maybe it's the way they were raised. They put up a wall. They want to be above people. They're not going to be hurt again. I don't know. There's so many theories out there. But we're looking for fruits. They're not aware of the impact and damage they cause other people because they don't put themselves in another person's shoes, which is empathy. They have no empathy. And this is really hard if someone is your leader and they have no empathy for you. Uh, you're in for abuse. Uh, they don't know how to enter into sufferings of other people unless it's going to benefit them somehow. Uh, what comes naturally for most people when they're humble, uh, narcissists don't understand that. They don't understand it. They block you out. They block out people's pain. 
I don't know, it might bring them back to some of their own pain. I don't know, but here we are with all this going on in our culture. Jesus called them wolves, Pharisees. They put heavy burdens on you. You have to do this. You have to go to church this many times. You, it's all these things, and if you don't do what their vision is, you can be shamed and put down, and you're not spiritual. And even though they call this a spiritual narcissist, I would say they're not spiritual. They're, you know, in the way that we know, they're religious. Just like the Pharisees were very, very religious. Most of the power that they get and their influence, they use to take care of themselves. The churches are all about them. They're set up where it's the leader and then they have a lot of flying monkeys around them. They're yes men that do what they say. And if you don't do what they say, you will be attacked or abandoned. Yep. Because narcissists don't handle criticism at all. It, they consider it a wound. So if you're trying to come out of these kind of systems, you have to find someone that's not in it. Because when people are in it, and I was in it too, you defend them and you minimize the pain. Well, after all, this is our leader, this is our pastor. Uh, you have to find somebody that says, this is strange behavior. You know, you are not being treated right, or this is too much to expect of people, whatever your situation might be. You have to find someone that's not drinking the Kool-Aid. which can be hard because, and then when people do come out and some people are bitter, they're angry, uh, try to forgive. If you have to walk away, which we've all had to walk away from different ones in our life that are narcissistic, um, make sure you keep your heart right because bitterness will hurt you and you've got to forgive. Even though you maybe don't see them anymore, there's such a freedom in letting it go and, and not trying to destroy someone. That's what they do. If they have a, a disagreement with someone, they will destroy you. They call it the smear campaign. But don't be like that. Just keep your heart right. That way you can still hear from the Lord. You won't have a hard heart. You're not bitter. And, you know, you come through it, and God will use you to help other people. Uh, narcissists want the authority of a king but the accountability of a toddler. Almost every narcissist I've met, they want to be superior, but they don't want responsibility. They don't want you to tell them, we had a, a leader that would just spend the church's money like it was his own, and no accountability. And that's a heavy thing to stand before God for just using all those uh, offerings and love gifts for the Lord on yourself. And you can just see it by the fruits. You can see it. Okay, the narcissists like to control everything. If you're working for someone that's a narcissist, it has to be their way. Everything is about them, and they love to control. They crave control because then they know how everything goes, and they feel superior and on top. It's hard and it's impossible to have a team with a narcissist because they don't work well with other people. So if you have a narcissistic leader in your business, uh, you're gonna lose people because there's some people just won't put up with it. And then it seems like the kind-hearted people that don't know how to say no, stay. And then they can become flying monkeys, which is just a slave, like a yes person. And God didn't create us to be like that. Right. They need to be the center of everything. They this is the part that used to really bother me. They use the talents and abilities of those around them, but then when they find another person, like for instance, a singer, and then they find a better singer, they discard them like a paper towel. And all of a sudden now this new singer is it for a while until another one that's better. That's not how the kingdom of God works. And they replace people without pity or remorse. Firing is, just got to fire them. So there's a pathway of destruction in all these ministries. They use people and then throw them away when done. 
And again, the pastorate is a very attractive position for religious narcissists because they love to be in front of people, get their narcissistic supply. That's the word I was trying to think of back. They, they have a supply that it makes them feel good. And one of the things they do to feel good is to put people down. So this isn't like Jesus at all. This is a spirit that's not even about God. It's about that leader. And it's unfortunate that many people in the charismatic movement are very narcissistic. They use the guard ca uh, card to cast their vision. You've got to take the pastor's vision and they use the God card. But the problem is they don't raise anyone else up. True leaders raise other people up. Yeah. They share, they share everything and that's a good leader. We're gonna finish with what, a good, what the difference of a boss and a leader is. Uh, the narcissistic pastor uses the pulpit to glorify themselves. All the stories are about them. And I had a f pastor, a friend, uh, actually it was a very famous worldwide minister, and all they did was talk about everything always turned off at the end of the whatever. It was always about them, about their stories and their husband and their, and it makes themselves, they use the pulpit to glorify themselves and gain power over others and to exploit anyone and everyone until they're no longer useful. Okay, we're gonna go into some warning signs here. First John 4, 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test. We gotta test spirits. It's okay to test the spirits. If it wasn't, he wouldn't have put this in there for us. So we need to test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. And it's sad to say, but many people that say they're Christians are not. I don't know if they're saved. I don't know. I can't judge that. But they've got a lot of issues that they should have dealt with before they became a leader. And we know that there's so many wolves in sheep's clothing. They've already been bought and paid for. And God showed us Judas in the Bible to let us know a lot of people are just out for their own agenda and they want the money. You can't serve God and money. If you're in the ministry, you're going to have to put God first. You can't put him second. So many of them are, are following their own agendas, money, fame, and now political stuff has come into the ministry. And they're making religion and politics one. And I've taught on that before. These false disciples come in many shapes and forms, but none is more dangerous than the spiritual narcissist. You're talking about abuse. You're talking about brainwashing and all these different things. What is a spiritual narcissist? It's someone who uses the gospel to build themselves up while they tear other people down. Here's some warning signs. The spiritual narcissists promote their vision, their accomplishments. They use a ministry and scriptures as a tool for self-promotion. And what's behind all this? It's that spirit of pride. And that's what got Lucifer so in trouble, was that spirit of pride. Pride makes a person spiritually toxic. And one of the big sayings is, if you don't like it here, don't let the door hit you on the way out. That's just a typical saying that they use. Uh, Micah 6, 8, we are to live justly, show mercy, and walk humbly with the Lord our God. And we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, to love our neighbors as our, ourself in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. And narcissists can't handle serving. They like to be served. Here's the pyramid. You can't love God if you're selfish. Being a Christian is to pick up our cross, deny ourselves, right? And that means you got, there's some suffering sometimes. To walk in love sometimes is suffering. 
but a spiritual narcissist always puts God second. They don't follow what the Bible says. Uh, whether it's by neglecting Christ's commands or how they treat their neighbor. I think God's very concerned about how we treat our neighbors. We're supposed to love the Lord our God and then love our neighbors. Pride will always make a person very toxic. And another thing I've noticed, and I looked this up, spiritual narcissists are bullies. Not all of them. But there is some kind of a spirit there that is so against anti-Christ deniers. They're bullies. And a bully is to hurt or threaten. Uh, they come into a music ministry and they threaten all, all the... These are volunteers, and I've, I've witnessed a lot of this. Uh, the so-called leader comes in and just... Here's volunteers. You're supposed to build them up. The Bible says we're, we're to build people up. Encourage one another while it's still today and build people up. Narcissus, the spirit, tears down. It breaks people. It doesn't build them up. And this is a big, huge red flag. If, if that leader is not building people up, I'm talking about their staff and things that can't be seen. By the, if they're not, if they're, the, the staff is being treated bad and the wife is being treated bad or the husband is being treated bad, um, it's a red flag. Because they like to bully, to hurt or threaten, intimidate or harass. There are worse narcissists. Uh, I've, I've met some coverts and they don't seem as bad, but they're almost more dangerous because they're more charming, they're more flattering, but behind your back they're always dividing. And the Bible says where there's strife and envy and division, there's confusion in every evil work. Someone, when we're walking with the Lord, we don't cause division on purpose. We don't have a lifestyle of division and strife and bullying. So if you're under this type of a leader or boss, you need to remove yourself if you can. Because they, they abuse you and they mistreat you. And that's not okay. <laughs> it's not okay. Right? They crave control and power over others. This reminds me of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans, Jesus hated the Nicolaitans because they were top-down authority. And there's not a whole lot that's said about them, but they aren't good. Because the, I always like to say the blood of Jesus made us all the same size. Another big huge flag is, red flag is they decree and dec declare love, <laughs> but never show it. That's the first fruit we should have when you get saved, is that we love, and we try to love. Matthew 7, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. What is the fruit that this leader brings to the table? Division, strife, jealousy. Narcissists have a very insecure uh, spirit and so if someone is uh, what I try to do is I like to raise up leaders but if they took up a, too good of an offering I was confronted in the back don't ever let them take up an offering again I was like wow you can't raise people up in this kind of an insecurity and someone that always wants to get rid of people that would look like they threatened their position a true leader is secure and it's just, to me, and my son is the same way, we love to, to give power to other people, and it's a team. It's so much better to have a team than just go solo. But narcissism is just, that's the way it is. Division, strife, jealousy. And this is what separates the true Christian from the spiritual narcissist. Love. Another thing about them, if you're dealing with them, they talk, but they don't listen. You can talk and tell them something over and over and over and over again. Nothing changes. They're quick to speak, quick to take offense. And if you wound them, they, they take that terrible, I mean, you are done. And they may still be around for a while, but they don't forget. And that's another thing. When people wound us, which they all do, we're all human. You've got to forgive. Let it go. Try to make it right. 
But there's something that once you've crossed the line and you see how they're operating and you confront them, they're incapable of listening. We need to be humble and listen and unselfish. And that's one thing a spiritual narc can never be. Spiritual nar narcissists live in an echo chamber. They love to surround themselves with yes men. Now Ahab in the Bible, he surrounded himself with 400 yes men. And Jehoshaphat wanted guidance from the Lord, so he, they called on Micaiah, as you know. But Ahab, this is what they do is, if you're gonna be around them, you're gonna have to say what they want you to say and act the way they want you to act. And Micaiah said what the Lord said, and because of that, Ahab punished him. Just another sign of things in the Bible that it's not really new. <laughs> Nothing's really new. We might have changed titles. We might have said something different, put a new label on it, but this behavior has been with us forever. The Old Testament. Another thing, they refuse to acknowledge their mistakes. So this is really unhealthy because when you blow it and you make up, it builds trust. But if, if someone never admits that they're wrong and it's always your fault, relationships cannot be built. They're broken. They have to protect their self-image and that's why they get very, very defensive. If you try to correct them, they won't listen because they're extremely insecure and defensive and they have to be right. A little bit more. Again, this is pride. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble, but he resists. If we get in pride, in which we can, uh, we're resisted because God hates the spirit of pride. Now humility allows us to learn from our mistakes. And as we walk humbly with the Lord, we make mistakes, we repent, we get back up again. A righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. But this kind of personality doesn't like to admit their mistakes uh, because they're not spiritual, spiritual at all. It's really a mask and it's a Pharisee spirit. And they always tear people down and they use the pulpit to do it. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, we are to encourage and build each other up. And again, they don't build, they break. They feel better about themselves when they put other people down. This is really an antichrist spirit. It's not, it's, it's not of the Lord. And lastly, they lead by force and dictatorship. They're the worst kind of leaders. They correct other people by humiliating them. They never mentor anyone because that would be a threat. Now, if they need someone in a different department and they need that person, that might be a different story. But for someone to take their place or to help them, usually they won't mentor. They're not good mentors at all. And I'm sorry for any of you that have bosses like this. And I know they're everywhere. Now, good leaders, they weigh, uh, they weigh their words carefully. If they have to correct, they think about it. They don't just blow, you know, attack, but they, they serve. They're there to serve, they're to be a good example. But narcissists love to be served and they like to be treated better than. They like to really be worshiped. They, it just so bothers me when they have a preacher come up and they all, you know, like they're, they're just, uh, it's just like a show, it's like a circus. This, and we all love God and wanted to serve him. This isn't what we, what we wanted, was this kind of a ministry. What are we supposed to lead by? We're supposed to lead by example. Behaving kind and loving, that builds trust. And closing here, I wanna share the difference between a boss, someone that's uh, operating in a wrong spirit, and then a true leader, someone that's operating in the right spirit. The boss drives employees. A true leader coaches them. The boss leads by fear, 
intimidation. They love to be in control that you're afraid you're going to lose your job or you're afraid of this. And they love to, that it's just such a bad spirit to be under. A true leader generates enthusiasm. We're going to get this done. We're going to do it. You know, I'm going to help you. We're going to do it together. We're a team. Or you get enthused rather than fearful and intimidated and shamed. Uh, the boss, the narcissist, places blame for the breakdown. A true leader fixes the breakdown, trying to find a solution. The boss knows how it's done, but a true leader shows how it's done. Just how Jesus was our example. He showed us how to live. He's given us words to live by. The boss uses people. A true leader develops people. The boss takes the credit. A true leader gives the credit. A boss commands. A true leader asks. A boss says, go. A true leader says, let's go. So here we see a difference between a solo <laughs> and a team. And we see that the way they, they rule their ministries, their businesses, or their families, or whatever, there's not a lot of love. It's a lot of fear. And God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. And he doesn't want us to rule by fear, right? So let's pray. Father, I just pray that these red flags will help people come out if they're underneath these or many people that write me they've come out but they're still hurting they're hurting because they've lost their friends they've lost their families they've lost their church so many different losses right now we just pray Lord you'd minister healing to them and that we won't grow bitter but we will protect ourselves if we need to leave a harmful hurtful situation for ourselves and our family uh, we will, with your grace, your strength, and your humility. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. If you would like to see more messages from Roberta on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to her YouTube channel, Roberta Morrison. Her backup channel, Roberta Morrison 2, the number 2, and on the Living in His Presence Church website where you can access the messages on the top center of the main webpage. There are free audio downloads of the messages. We are viewer supported. On the main webpage at the top right is a give button. Thank you for watching and see you next time.